John Wineland. How are you, brother? I'm very good, Brian. How are you doing? I'm, I'm well, thank you, man. I'm, I'm really honored to have you on Men This Way. Thank you. Truly. It's my pleasure to be here. We've, we've shared a stage together. Remember the, the, the sexuality symposium at Wanderlust? Right. And we had a, a kind of funny moment, right? Remember that Sheila Kelly moment, the S Factor moment, all oh, the whole oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, hundred people are, are, are you know, broken out into this, this uh, beautiful intimate uh, intimacy practice. Sheila Kelly, who does S Factor, has all the women dancing for, for, for men and, and you and I are just standing there. <laughs> respectfully in the back You're right thoughtfully just holding space just Hold. holding space yeah yeah you know you know uh, other than that you know you and i haven't really been able to connect our our we've kind of orbited in some ways um uh i think i got i got locked out once from one of your men's workshops because <laughs> i showed up a couple minutes late respect man respect yeah. i get it yeah. um yeah. But nonetheless, John, you know, your name, your, your image, your work has been, um, has, has, you know, in the world of masculine and feminine study, sexual polarity practice, and a men's embodiment, your name is going on legendary status, I dare say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you, loom, know. you loom large in the space in a really, in a really powerful way. And that's why I wanted to have you on the program. It's very kind of you to say. I've 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 worked for a long time at it. Yeah, yeah. Practice, practice, practice. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No such thing as an overnight success. There's only twenty and thirty year overnight successes. Right, right, right. Yeah. I I I I'm a, I subscribe to the. Yeah, I'm sure you've read Outliers. You know the ten thousand hour. I'm, yes, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Yep. You know, man. I, if I look at all the people that I really dig in the world that I really respect, they've, they've kind of followed that path. Yeah. They, they've put the time in and, yeah. um, yeah. and you know, I might, I might be maybe halfway there, but you know, yeah. it's definitely, I, I think there's some, I, I wrote an article called fuck hacking go deep. Cause I, mm -hmm. I kind of think like that, yes. that, that idea has been lost a little bit, like, mm -hmm. you know, but I know it. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. have a video that I haven't put out. That's all about, you know, put down your bulletproof coffee already. Stop fucking trying right. to hack your life <laughs> and just right. fully be present in it. Live it. Right. Be, be, right. be with what's happening. Yeah. But, but John, I can't imagine that as a kid, this is what you dreamed of being. <laughs> it's so funny, right? I mean, like, did you think that, that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, like, Hey, I'm going to be leading workshops where people are going to be doing, you know, sexual intimacy practice and yeah. rolling around on the floor and crying. And right. I mean, no, yeah, no. I, what, I what did you want to be as a kid? A baseball player, baseball player. Who'd you want to play yeah. for? Dodgers. The I grew Dodgers. up in LA. Okay. I grew up in LA. Okay. I grew up uh, like a Vin Scully. Okay. Yeah. You know, the big blue wrecking crew kind of thing. And it's yeah, a classic a Dodgers fan. fan. Yep. Yeah. Still am. Still am. Uh, okay. I respect that. How, did you play in high school? Yeah. I played in high school. I also played basketball. Okay. I actually played with a guy named Greg Maddox, who's pretty well known. Him, he was a year, he was a, a year behind me. Now he's in the hall of fame and I'm doing what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it just goes to show you yeah. the best, the best laid plans of teenagers. Well, what, Tell us about a, a, a significant event or experience then in your early life that really played a fundamental role in, in shaping your journey as a man. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the one that really looms large and that I still, you know, have to work with occasionally hmm. is the, my stepfather was, I was, my dad split when I was young. Mm -hmm. And so I had, a how, how old were you? 18 months, 18 yeah. months. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I come from that kind of thing, you know, yeah. my, my mom and dad were hippies. My dad kind of did his thing. Mm. So, so I grew up with all women pretty much. Yeah. Except I had a stepfather yep. who was with me from the time I was like four till 10 and at 10, mm. he was murdered when I was 10, he was mm. murdered. And, um, and it was one of those experiences where I just walked, I was playing football out in the street with my friends, happy as can be. I walked in the living room and then 
there was just like everybody was crying and mm -hmm. and um and i remember uh that you know that i've gone back and looked that i've gone back and looked at that moment from a bird's a god's eye view yeah, yeah. right and that's definitely one of the moments that shaped my shaped my life right and it's funny i look now and i think you know, I'm a guy who grew up with virtually no masculine leadership. Yeah. My grandfather's died. Yeah. Richard died. And so what do I teach? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like I'm writing a book on masculine leadership. Yeah. So, uh, so it just goes to show you how your, you know, your biggest wounds become your gifts. And, yeah. And I, mean, it's, uh, I see this in a lot of, of men in, in our space. Um, I, I too, you know, when I was four, my dad left and, and my, my stepfather didn't even arrive till many years later. And, and he came, you know, good heart, but very wounded in the execution of his, his presence, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I grew up with women, strong women as well. You know, three sisters, basically two moms that really held things together. And so I was very disoriented around being a man. Mm -hmm. And um, so I see that, you know, in, in our, in our work, there's the, your, your mess is your message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, I didn't know that about you, man. I really appreciate um, hearing that background and, and um, can so understand. I know for me and even why I'm doing this podcast and I'm, I'm why I'm having men like you on this podcast is because I'm soaking it all up. Mm -hmm. I wonder how, how, you know, what role have then mentors played in your experience, male mentors specifically, you know, mentors, friendships with men, how has that then enriched your life given that you grew up without that significant? Yeah. yeah, well, a huge. In fact, I'm, I can, I can say unequivocally, I would not be here if it wasn't for the men in my life. Like I have, I'm actually surrounded by in my opinion, the greatest men on the planet. Mm. The, the best teachers, the, the, you know, I, I got sober when I was 29 mm. and, uh, and I just, I fell into men's groups. Mm -hmm. like I, there was a men's meeting here in Santa Monica on the promenade every day at noon wow. and guys from 18 to 70, you know, with one day of sobriety to 40 years of sobriety. Mm. And I lived at that meeting for the first 10 years of my sobriety. Mm. And those guys are the guys that, helped me raise taught me how to be a dad taught me how to start a business taught me how to chase a dream and uh, i still you know 20 years 20 years later i still see um those guys every thursday night we you know so so, so that was I a group, history with them yeah. that was a group of men that were meeting that the the core thing that brought you all together was addiction or recovery yeah sobriety yeah we we're all we we're all sober yeah we we're all in you know we were all sober so so yeah, we all came together and met on this restaurant and had lunch together every day, almost every day yeah. for, for 10 years or so. And yeah. those guys are still, when I, when my daughter died a few months back, those were the guys that were at my, um, you know, at my side. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my, you know, my sponsor, my deep, one of my dearest friends came down yeah. the night that I found out that she was going to have to mm. be taken off life support. Yeah took me to a Korean spa and to dinner, like that kind of like just, yeah. just yeah. held me. Right. Mm. So those guys, those guys are those guys. And, and since then, uh, other men in my men's group, uh, you know, my David, who's a teacher of mine, and mm -hmm. I've just, I've just had great men yeah. really blessed there. Yeah. I, I love how you language that it held me. Mm. It's not something that, you know, this podcast is for men. I know a lot of women will be listening, but this podcast is for men. And that's not something that we talk about. Well, I want to say needing or but we don't just don't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. The need to be held by other men, particularly when we're fucking going through it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was kind of blessed with, um, cursed and blessed with a situation where I needed help. I mean, I was, you know, maybe a year sober. So I still had my head way up my ass. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> you know, I come from a long line of hard drinking Irish, Scottish uh -huh. alcoholics. Right. And, uh -huh. and, um, 
and I had my head up my ass and, and then I had this daughter who was born, this really beautiful, wonderful girl that was born, who was born sick. And I, I knew that I could not take care of her on my own. Mm. So I was, I was, it's almost like God forced me to, to, to be able to reach out and to depend on other men and rely on other men. And yeah. I'll tell you, Ryan, like those guys came to the hospital when Claire was sick and they would, they would sing songs and spend time with her. And mm. you know, they were the guys that helped start her foundation, which mm. became, you know, which is now became her platform. I don't know if you know, but mm -hmm. that became her platform. So literally like I owe, I owe my entire life to the, the incredible men that have supported yeah. me. Yeah. You've mentioned, you, you've talked um, about your, your daughter dying, acknowledging that. And I mean, how could you not? I know it's fresh. Um, yeah. And I actually found out through my news app on mm -hmm. my phone that this, this, this light in the world named Claire Wineland had died and I was so touched and, but I didn't make the connection. It was actually my partner, Sylvie, who, cause I didn't know you had a daughter because we don't know each other that well. And, um, and when I found out and I made the connection, I was just gutted. I mean, it was sad to begin with, but then when that, that, that connection was made and I, and knowing the work that you do and, and I, I know you and your family are, are still grieving. I'd like to just ask you really one question about that experience. Because I believe that death is something that men must reconcile with if we're going to live fully. What is this difficult experiencing teaching you that you could share with us now? Hmm. Well, there's two parts to it. Um, mm -hmm. One is the part pre-death, right? Like having to, because Claire was sick and we knew that she was not mm -hmm. going to live as long yeah. as most people yeah. I had to get right with death before she died. And, and that gave us a really beautiful mm -hmm. appreciation of the time we had. Mm -hmm. And it also gave us a lot of humor around death you know what i mean yeah. like we actually had a really we had a lot of fun with it like her mm. and I, you know play with it a lot yeah um so leading up to it i kind of take a carlos castaneda view of yeah. death you know which is like death is near right, right? but it ha hasn't taken me yet mm -hmm. but i always know he's a few feet away and I could feel not only my death, but I could feel my daughter's death a few feet away. And it really did help sharpen me in a certain way. Yeah. And really, and, and it opened my heart. Like I just, yeah. I loved her unabashedly. Yeah. So leading to that, I had to, I, it allowed me to really feel how impermanent everything is. Yeah. And then once she died, um, it wasn't necessarily expected. We were hoping she would have a new set of lungs and have a new, like a few more years to, with these new set of lungs. So it wasn't expected. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had to really go into the depths of pain like I've never had to before. You know, yeah. and I've experienced death before. Yeah. And, um, and so it was a big practice in staying open. I tried to write a lot about it. Mm. I tried to just be with, be supported. Mm. Um, as luck would have it or fate would have it, you know, my partner of seven years and I broke up literally a week before Claire died. Mm. And so I was going through two, the two biggest um, wow. feminine presences in my wow. life mm. at that time. And, and I felt so lost. Yeah. Like I, I was lost man. Yeah. and I just, yeah. I leaned on the men. I mean, I was on the phone three or four times a day with my brothers, guys in, you know, guys in my men's group, um, uh, you know, my teachers. And I just, uh, I just relaxed into it and felt, yeah. and I felt the pain. So I guess post death, it's really about relaxing into the death, relaxing into it. And mm. pre death for me, it was about appreciating the time we had. Yeah. yeah. I'll say one, one last thing Please. about that. Cause I think, I think, I think this is actually a really important lesson for me at least and Claire too. 
I realized, you know, in the last few years, I would not have traded in a healthy Claire for the Claire that I had. Mm. And she felt the same way. Like she wouldn't have traded in a healthy life. Mm. I mean, she wanted to get healthy, of course, but she yeah. wouldn't have tra- tra- traded her experience for the experience that she was having. And I think that really is part of what made her message so special. And yeah. also for me, feels like a, a really deep lesson for me to be yeah. grateful with what you have as painful as it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, when I, when I learned of her death and I, I, I went into research, who is this woman? And, and, and I saw just the way that she showed up. I mean, a light, a light in the world. I was so touched and so moved by, and this was even before I made the connection uh, with you. So um, how do you, you know, relaxing into the pain and relaxing into the experience I think, you know, both you and I work with couples and I know that's a common challenge that us men have is just that relaxing into what is present, what is here rather than bypassing it, you know, rationalizing it away. I mean, you know, I've so many men I've heard from stories who have, who've had deaths early in their life. Like I remember one man telling me, um, you know, mom died when he was like eight years old and dad's approach was just get over it. Uh move on, get over it, right? Yeah. Suck it up, get over it. And I can even, you know, a, a couple months ago, well, maybe a year ago, my dad and I, we've been healing our relationship. And I, I got a phone call from him maybe a year ago and, and it, it didn't, you know, it went like it always went, which wasn't well. Mm-hmm. And um, I was sad, but I was driving and my partner told me, she said, Brian, it's okay if you want to pull over the car and just be sad. And I was, no, I don't want to pull over the car. I got, we got somewhere to go. Fuck this shit. <laughs> I, got, I got shit to do. Yeah. But she was so right in the sense of where am I going? Other than just avoiding still more, avoiding what's present. How, why does that matter? Mm. John, why does it matter a, for men to learn this practice? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. Um, because it's the deepest play of the moment, right? I mean, I think most guys that I know, like you said, kind of float along the surface of their lives, like chasing achievement, chasing comfort, chasing validation. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, is that there's a, there's a possibility for depth in every moment. And if you're feeling sad, about your daughter or about your father, about whatever. And you bypass that, you miss that opportunity to go deep. You're literally missing an opportunity to train your nervous system to hold more. And the byproduct of holding more is that more will be sent to you. Mm. The, The more capable your nervous system is at being with your own emotional energetic body, the more I believe the universe just kind of the more magnetic you get. Yeah. Let's put it that way. The more mm-hmm. magnetic you get. Mm-hmm. So magnetism is one great reason why that's important to feel as deeply mm. as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, depth and integrity. I mean, to me, it's about integrity. If I'm sad and I'm mm-hmm. avoiding the sadness, I'm out of yeah. it in personal integrity and the world will feel it. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of, I mean, it's sort of the masculine code is integrity, your word, being in congruence with your word. And yet when it comes to emotional integrity, Mm -hmm. we generally tend to throw emotions out as having anything to do with integrity. It's the complete opposite in my book. (laughs) You know, a man and women can feel this, right? Like if, if I, if I'm avoiding anger, if I'm angry and everybody knows it, but I'm denying it, I'm not angry. yeah, right. I'm going to be felt as a man of, of low integrity and they won't necessarily know why they'll just yeah. feel like I'm not trustable. That's right. That's right. It'll come out as I don't really trust you or I don't feel safe around you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And yet we as men will then in bewilderment, <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm so trustworthy. Mm-hmm. I keep I'm my so, word. I'm so safe. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I say I'm going to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the I like the definition of integrity as 
you know, structural, there's structural integrity, meaning uh-huh. in my, in my posture is standing. I mean, you've done this work, yeah. right? You know, yeah. it, are, are you grounded? Like there's a structural integrity. Yeah. Um, but the emotional integrity is, are you really, are you feeling and in relationship with the truth of your emotional body? Yeah. Yeah. Integrity. Hear that? Hear that men listening? Integrity is not just about the words coming out of your mouth. It is integrity in how you're holding your body. You know, I I noticed, John, you know, I've been with my partner for a little over three years now and she, like every woman has been the best teacher I've ever had. And, but this one is like, this is my PhD plus level, level course. And one of the things that I've really gotten present to is when when I'm upset, when we're in an argument, I will cross my arms and turn my body away from her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm trying to hold it together, you know, speak rationally, sort of not get upset and angry, but clearly my body yeah. is telling her, right. well, it's a lot of things really. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been something I really, I really want the men listening to, to get that point that how we hold our body What's happening? I think this is the one of my teachers, uh, Steve James. You know Steve James? I don't know Steve. Oh Good yeah, one. I know Steve. Oh yeah, I know Steve. Yeah, yeah sure. So I, I I interviewed him Guru and Viking. And Guru yeah. Viking. I love yes. that. Yeah, love that that man. Uh, I've studied with him, and I love the way he defined intimacy as as seeing what is there to be seen and feeling what is there to be felt. Mm-hmm. Right, and I can imagine in in your I think grieving is something we men must learn to beyond just when something huge happens. Mm-hmm. What, what would you say about that? The role of grieving in our lives? Well, uh, unless, unless you've grown up with the most, you know, conscious parents on the planet and even mm-hmm. so they probably still fucked you up. <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, you've got grief. And I mm-hmm. think that, I think men don't feel the value of grief. Yeah. We assume, you know, men are always looking for the value proposition. Like, mm-hmm. how's this going to make me more money, get me laid, get mm-hmm. me what I want, get me, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and grief traditionally doesn't have a great value proposition. Yeah, it's all bad. And it's all bad. And yet, the most, um, the most impact I've had on people in my life um, have been when I've been openly in, in integrity with my grief. Mm. You know? And, you know, the, when I've written that way, when I've taught that way, when I've been with my partners that way, when I've, you know, I, I've, I've, when I've given talks that way, it, it, it has the deepest impact. And so grief actually, actually has a, is a gift and I think it's a gift that a lot of men, for, for men to share their grief in a way that is inspiring and opens people's hearts, that's a gift. And I think mm. it's a gift that a lot of men um, miss giving. And, and I'd, I want to really draw this distinction out because I, I had an experience that really shocked me a couple of years ago. I have a huge family, but I haven't really been with death much in my family. Um, I haven't had the the big obvious causes to grieve. It's coming, God willing, if I'm fortunate to not be the one that everyone's grieving. Right. 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 <laughs> but but I had an experience f- maybe two years ago where I, I sold a truck. This was a truck that I that had taken me from Florida to California, that I had toured with an amazing music band, five brothers who were basically my husbands for a couple of years. And, um, and the brand band broke up. We had all these magical experiences. And then I sold the truck a couple of years after. I mean, it's, it, it, it carried me to burning man three times, all kinds of stuff. I cried like a baby mm-hmm. the night that I sold that truck and I've never been into cars or trucks or anything. I don't give a shit about those things. And yet I sobbed mm-hmm. in a way. And my partner my woman, she was with me. She probably helped get it out of me too. She has that effect. So I just wanted to draw that distinction, John, because I know you're going through something that everyone would agree is grieve worthy. <laughs> right. 
But I think, I think what you're pointing at too is, is grieving. There's so much to grieve. Yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, from the loss of something that's very like, that is like an end of an era, I guess maybe yeah, the yeah. truck was an era. But I also think that as we do the work, as we become more embodied, as we deepen in our kind of physical and energetic bodies, we start to tap into the grief of the entire, not just the mm. world around us, but mm-hmm. our epigene- our, our lineage, um, the pain of our clients, yes. yeah. you know? And, and so the more sensitive we get to the world, the more, the more, the more available we are, yeah. but also the more we're picking up the grief of yeah. not just us, but other people. Yeah. And that's, that's a big part of it for me. You, you wrote something I, I, that I, I think I read in the book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, the first idea of this. And you, you just re, re, recently re, I don't know, not re, but in your own words, in your own experience, you, 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 you said something really beautiful. You said, Men, it's time to take responsibility for the sins of our fathers and brothers. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, please share more about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, the jury's still out on how that's affecting men. You know, I think, I think some guys are inspired by it. Some guys are, fuck you, asshole. Like, mm-hmm. yep. um, you know, I didn't do it. Yep. Um, I just think we're at, a, we're at a crucial moment in history. Yep. And I think in this moment in history, we as men have to, you know, to use Steve's example of intimacy, right? Yeah, to be yeah. with what is, right? Yeah. And to love what is, to feel what is. Well, what is, is that women are waking up to an incredible amount of pain and trauma over a hundred thousand years of being owned. The planet is in a bit of trauma, right? I mean, the planet's going to be fine. We're fucked, but the planet's going to be fine. And so, so we're, what is, is that men have created trauma in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's irresponsible and a little immature, I think, quite frankly, for us to step into a relationship or to step into a role on the planet as a teacher or to, you yeah. know, to just acknowledge being a, an agent for social change without understanding that we actually have to take on what other men have done where other men have led us. Yeah. And I'm a big, you know, I write a lot about masculine leadership and it's, and I think one of the first things you have to do is to acknowledge what you're stepping into. And what we're stepping into is a kind of a shit show um, of ma- a man made shit show. And so the first step in healing is to acknowledge yeah. that we, that us and our lineage, yeah. and maybe in some instances, us personally have yeah. helped cause that. Yeah. I've seen that in, in, in my own intimate relationship, you know, my partner comes with trauma. She comes with a past totally. Tr- trauma caused by the ignorance of other men. And I have attempted early in the relationship, especially to say, Hey, this isn't mine to deal with, <laughs> which John, you know how that goes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> not well, yeah. not well. Yeah. And in fact, our relationship has succeeded and even thrived really um, contingent upon my growth in taking responsibility, not blame. I think that's very different. Not blame, yeah. but responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. For helping to heal the, 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 the trauma the, the, that, I sure. didn't, that I didn't do, at least not to her. I probably did in other ways to other women. Absolutely. It, to me, I think, I mean, I think that men going into relationships uh, and, le- you know, again, this idea of ma- what masculine leadership is to me, right? I mean, yeah. this is just my definition. Yeah. It, it really starts with what you just spoke about, which is, to have the awareness and the wisdom to acknowledge the woman you love has this going on. Yeah. My value is to support her, lead her, be with her, encourage her, love her as she is. Yeah. Not to just want to extract the juicy, sexy, playful parts of her and then send her to therapy for everything else. (laughs) But you know (laughs) what I mean? Like go deal with this baby. You know, you know, 
I just yeah. don't, I, 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 I just think that's lazy and it's not effective. Yeah. And I think almost every man stepping into an intimate relationship is going to be stepping into a situation like this. Yeah. And I would just prefer they step in aware. Yeah. And somewhat inspired to be a, you know, to really serve. And in, in fact, what I've found through, again, direct experience is the more I'm willing to take responsibility, again, not blame, but responsibility and being with my partner in, in, in the growth and the healing. And she's doing her work. She's doing, you know, as, yeah. as, as I'm doing my own trauma healing work as well. Yeah. Um, that actually the sexy, juicy, that, that vixen that just, you know, just lights up my world and fucks me every way I want to be fucked. Mm -hmm. um, she shows up. Yeah. She, she, she shows up and there's more of her. <laughs> yeah. Know, there's more of her available. Yeah. I, I had an experience with a, a woman that I'm dating where, you know, early on it became clear that she had stuff with her father. Right. And it, it was like a, it was like a block in our intimacy. And I was like, okay, well I could either, like shut down and avoid it or blame her or tell her to go take care of it. Or I could use some of my skills. Right. So we did this like right in the middle of it. We kind of did this deep shadow work practice and I held her through this whole process where she went back into high school and met her 16 mm -hmm. year old self and mm -hmm. was sobbing and crying and went through this whole thing and came out the other end of it, just like open and, and, mm -hmm. And in some way having, all I did was hold space and lead a little bit and she met herself there. And that's my value yeah. to her. You know what I mean? Like yeah. th that's me taking her someplace that she could not have taken herself in that moment. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the opportunity that I would like to teach men is available. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you don't have to be a teacher of this. You just have to have some, understanding of what they're dealing with and really yeah. hold space give her a pillow and say you know like beat on the pillow baby yeah. i'm right here i fucking yeah. love you when you beat yeah. on yeah yeah i mean just doing that um and so i i think there's so and, and and the intimacy like you said the intimacy that comes from being witnessed in that experience is beautiful for a yeah. feminine being yeah it's beautiful yeah uh, let, let's stay here for a moment I, i'd love to to, to make this and maybe, or maybe there's something else you'd want to highlight um, around relationship, but what do you think is the, is a core, core insight, core practice, something, but what do you think is the main thing that men really need to know or learn to create a truly fulfilling intimate relationship? Hmm. Uh, well, there's a few, but I'll give the one that yeah. seems that is coming through me right now. You know, I, I would, I would ask men to learn the capacity for embodied to em, for embodied presence, right? It's one thing to be present, mm -hmm. right? You can like, be, like physically in the room. Yeah. And, and aware and aware you know, Eckhart, Tol, yeah. Eckhart Tolle uh, style, right? You know, I mean? like right. I'm, I can hear the most distant sound. Right. I can, you know, Neo in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can feel, I can sort of, I can, I'm, I'm yeah. present. Yeah. But to embody presence is a different practice and it requires a groundedness. It requires breath. It requires uh, a relaxation of the heart. It requires a wide awareness. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, that capacity to, to own that structure. It's a yogic practice like David talks about and David mm -hmm. Data talks about this. Mm -hmm. It's a yogic practice and that practice relaxes the nervous system of a feminine being. Mm -hmm. and allows whatever wants to come up to come up mm -hmm. because now I'm holding the structure of the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm embodied presence and I'm allowing anything that she needs to bring up to come up. Yeah. So to me, that's like table stakes. Gotta yeah. learn that. Just, you gotta just learn, yeah. You, yeah. You gotta learn to be a, an embodied presence. Yeah. You, you have a, a quote on your website that I really enjoyed. Uh, it's a roomy quote. Mm. There is one way of breathing that is shameful and constricted. Mm. Then there's another way, a breath of love that takes you all the way to infinity. Mm. Yeah. It's poetic, 
but it's also very practical, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like he's giving you the yogic practice, right? Breathe, you know, breathe infinity. Um, breathe, uh, to me, when I hear that, I guess what I'm, what I'm imagining he's saying is breathe in a way that your body opens so much mm. that you feel infinity. Yeah. 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 I, I noticed, as I said earlier, you know, I'll, I'll cross my, when I'm, when I'm triggered and in my upset state, I'll cross my arms and I'll, I'll turn away. Yeah. And a, one of my just basic practices is to just turn and face her, drop my arms and just breathe a little more deeply. Yeah. Yeah. It's crucial. I, I do. I try to do that. And then like, remember to ground, like feel my feet sinking into mm. the earth or feel the earth kind of feeding me. Mm. I've, I've been studying a, a fair amount of martial arts lately. And mm -hmm. it's amazing the link between sexual yogic practice and martial arts. Mm. I'm learning stuff from him and I'm going, Fuck, like that's that's exactly what I teach people, you know, and that's what yeah. that's what my teacher teaches. So I, you know, there's something about like being in the center line. Mm -hmm. In martial arts, they'll teach you in kung fu, they'll teach you be in the center line, like always own the center line or have the center line. And it's the same in intimacy. Like you want your center line to be lined with hers or his mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. whoever you're being intimate with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again the embodiment practice is so crucial. Well, you know, as you're describing that, you're like, I love that. Be center aligned. Is that, was that the, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm thinking even with a cup of coffee, being center yeah. aligned with a cup of coffee, right. that is going to be the best fucking cup of coffee I've ever had. Right, right, right. right. Fully present. You're basically <laughs> taking the deepest part of your body, like that part, that part from your throat, you know, behind the heart, right in front of the spine, all the way down the front of the body to the perineum, if you're a man, mm -hmm. cervix, if you're a woman, you're taking the deepest part of your body and you're centering it on the thing you want to be intimate with. Yeah. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, but yeah. most of us, you know, are not aware enough to practice it. I know. Myself included, you know. Of, I mean, of course, kind of, of, yeah. of, of course. You know, I, I often tell couples and, and men especially when i'm when i'm when we're working together and 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 uh, i give them a practice i say look if you just do this one out of 10 times this ever arises that's huge mm -hmm. it's better than the zero out of a th out of infinity that you're doing it now <laughs> right right a 10 percent. if you can increase your capacity 10 percent a year you know in 10 years you're enlightened yeah it's, you mass, it's that's huge yeah so John, I'm curious, how, how do you incorporate one of the, one of the, one of the, the dilemmas or the questions that I, I love to approach in these conversations is, is, you know, how do you know what to do? How do you know? And, and I frame it, how do you know what to say yes to versus no to, you know, professionally, whether to stay in a relationship, whether to mm. like, like how you, you do a lot of work with the felt sense, what comes up in your body, all of that. Mm what's your formula for what you know to say yes to versus what is a no for you? Mm, that's a good question. Well, I, I tend to argue that, that leading for, you know, men leading from the essential masculine from your essential masculine is the practice of resting as infinity or consciousness or emptiness or God, whatever you want to call it and feeling what needs to happen next. So you, so you rest as, you know, my practice, and I learned this directly from David, right? Mm -hmm. My practice is to rest as consciousness. So I, I experienced that as kind of a feeling from the back of my mind out, like consciousness that holds mm -hmm. everything together. Mm -hmm. And then feel the field in front of me. Like it could be a relationship, it could be a business, it could be an opportunity, like feel with my body. So. Mm -hmm. My awareness is resting as consciousness. My body's feeling what's present in the moment. And something, an intuition will come about what to do next or mm -hmm. what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and it's to me, that has been, that's the practice of, of, of good, of deep, sacred leadership. Mm -hmm. Man or woman, doesn't matter. But, mm -hmm. but it's a masculine practice. And... And I think that that's something that I would, that a lot of men miss because we're strategizing all the fucking time, you know, yeah. like, how do I get what I want? How do I yeah. win? 
if we stop strategizing and we really like kind of land in the pocket of the moment and feel what needs to happen next often whatever decision we make is probably going to be better yeah and so if it's a business opportunity that's kind of what i would say i would like you know feel it rest is consciousness feel it and wait for something to come does it maybe yeah yeah you wait and then maybe you're not a hell yes to that you know you're kind of a maybe but you would be a hell yes if they paid you this much and did this for you mm. and had this person involved and right. right. And so you can at very, at the very least get clear if you're not mm. a hell yes, speaking about a business opportunity or a relationship, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not a, what would you need to be a hell yes? Yeah. But all of that tends to come from a deeper, it's better if it's coming from a deeper place and not your monkey mind. Which yeah. is normally coming from your childhood, unmet childhood needs, you know. Right. Do you ever? Well, or, or I should ask is, you know, what is your relationship to fear in the face of taking action? Mm. Like, have you ever been terrified to do something really big that you knew you had to do and you did it anyway? And and if so, you know, what got you over the fear? I yeah. say, if so, I know, I mean, shit, man, of yeah. course, it's your journey in life, but <laughs> you know. Well, fuck, I had to walk into a, a hospital room and take my daughter off of life support. Oh man. And I was, I was terrified. Yeah. I, I, the last Gosh. thing in the world I wanted to do was that. Mm. And, and I, the reason I'm using this example to answer your question yeah. is because it was the biggest fear. Yeah. And the thing that I did is the thing yeah. that I try to teach, mm. people, which is, Fear, if we're going to use the lexicon that I've used, right, you know, about the masculine and feminine, fear is an emotion. All emotions are the feminine. Fear is just a very strong fem piece of the feminine energetic. Mm. So my feminine, my fear, needs a strong container. Mm. Now that container can be other men or other women, like somebody holding, helping me hold it. And so I always try to deal with fear by creating the strongest container I can. Mm -hmm. And that might be bookending. Like I'm afraid to make this call, man. I'm going to call you now, tell you I'm afraid. And then I'm going to call you when I'm done. I've just created a container for my fear. Mm -hmm. And, and so rather than try to get over fear or pretend it's not there um, or stall with it, I try to teach men because a lot of men have this discipline, like a lot of lack of discipline is really fear unprocessed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so create containers, Yeah, you know, enlist the help of other people to hold you. Yeah. And, and it's much more, it's much more enjoyable and it's just much more fun and healthy, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to walk through fear with other people. Man, just, I just, I don't even have the words, just such, such deep reverence and, and respect and appreciation for your experience. And it's a life has been sharpening you to do this work, man, ever more and more. What a fucking curse. And also I know it's a, the most amazing blessing. Yeah. Thank you. Brian. Um, thank you. One last question and then we'll go to our, our five key takeaways finale. Okay. What is the biggest challenge that you think men are facing today? And what wisdom could you offer in the face of it? Mm. Um, the biggest challenge I think is how easy it is to numb. Mm. It's just so easy to numb on social media, video games, drugs, food, sex, you know, it's just numbness is just like, for, there for our consumption at every mm. turn mm. and and the biggest challenge i think men are facing is to to eschew numbness and deepen mm. deepen and and so whatever that means if it's deepen into a practice deepen into a marriage deepen into grief deepen into sex like what needs to get deeper in your life that usually requires a lack of numbness, like an awareness and an mm -hmm. attunement. Mm -hmm. It usually requires, you know, uh, no distraction. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you can't go deep while you're checking your Instagram. Profound. I mean, I guess you can. I guess you can, but it's a well practice, deep, man. deep into what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Deep into what is the question? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's profound, man. Thank you. Profound. Thank you. So, John, let's move on to the five key takeaways finale. Uh, it, which is a name of this final round, which I still don't like. I don't like the name. That might be the ongoing running joke of this whole podcast is I have this name for the finale that I don't like. And uh, so if you can come up with something better, man. I'm open to it. Yeah, yeah, sure. But the point of it is, is I want to give men, I mean, look, you just dropped some incredible wisdom and insight and, and, um, I encourage all men to go back and listen to this again because you're going to hear it. You're going to hear things you didn't hear the first time. I mean, that's what I love about these conversations and um, is that you can just stretch them out and there's so much more to discover. But this final round, I want men to, as soon as they stop listening to this podcast, that they have some, something to work with, keep insights and practices, tools, resources to actually go and search, look out and, and work with. So there's five. Let's dive in. Number one, key insight. And you've already offered a lot, but let's summarize it. What's the one key insight that you would offer listeners that you believe can make a meaningful impact on their lives because it has in yours? Mm. Um, make death an ally know that death is coming and, and plan accordingly, including right now, this act. Yeah. 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 Make every act as if it's your last. I'm, I'm hosting a retreat in, in, in Ireland, um, upcoming and, and on the website, it's a, just a landing page. And, and at the bottom, I, 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 you know, my, my last frame on the page is remember you're going to die. In big, bold letters. And it's even right. for me, it's like, is this really good marketing? <laughs> Reminding people that they're going to fucking die. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And yet, John, thank you. I mean, from someone who is intimate with death in, in ways that I still, I can't, still don't even access yet because of, I haven't had these kinds of experiences that you're having. Um, thank you for that. You're welcome. Key mentor. Name another man that you've been inspired by, living or dead, that you would recommend the men listening to learn more about. Yeah, well, I would have to. I would have to acknowledge David Data. Um, yeah, he's been my teacher for ten years, and uh, you know, spent thousands of hours with him, and continue to go back and assist yeah. and do everything I can with him because yeah. I, I would not be doing what I'm doing without David's influence. You know groundbreaking yep. kind of work in this area. Yeah. Likewise. What yeah. was the starting point for you? For, for me, it was when I received the book, someone gave me the book, The Way of the Superior Man, right when I was out of a, 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 break, a terrible relationship breakup. What was it for you? Yeah. Well, I had a similar thing. Somebody gave me the book, but I, I just, I couldn't even read it. I was that fucking... So what does that really mean? The book? Like, what yeah. does that mean? I went to my first workshop to be it, to actually experience this stuff through my body. Yeah. Um, in 2008 was my first workshop with David. So uh, okay. yeah, so that was my, my big experience. If, yeah. if you get a chance, if any of your listeners get a chance to go do work with David, yeah. you know, not teaching a lot and who knows yeah. how long he's going to teach, go, go, you know, pony up and go do it. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you. Key resource your most impactful, inspiring book, movie, or podcast of the last year? I have really did dove into the Carlos Castaneda works. Yeah, I love, I love to, his books. Yeah, Journey to Ixlan, I think is a really, is, is one that talks a lot about uh, meticulousness and warriorhood from a, in a way that's really accessible. So I would send men there. Great. And, and I and all, all David's books too, but yep. Carlos is somebody I've been Carlos Castaneda. Yeah, Tales of Power, his work mm -hmm. that really changed me in many ways. So for, for all for, for your listeners, I will put all of this in the show notes in case you don't if in case you, you miss this, you're driving or something, you can't write it down. It'll be in the show notes at Brian Reeves. It's Brian with a Y Reeves.com slash podcast. 
under uh, John and John Wyland's episode. Number four, key investment. In the last year, what's the best thing you spent money on under $10,000? Under $10,000, okay. Um, huh. Taking a chance and flying a woman out to California from New York on a hunch that we would connect. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, key practice. This is the, the, the fifth key takeaway. Key practice. You are a man all about practice, John. Please offer one consistent practice, spiritual, creative, personal, or relational that has served you well and that you challenge the men listening to take on for the next seven days. Okay. Um, horse stance, horse stance, which is, you know, legs kind of open. I mean, you can look up what horse stance is sitting in horse stance, connecting to the magnetism of the earth, putting your hands out in front of you and literally feeling your heart in your hands. This is a practice that was given to me by a martial arts instructor. Mm. And, and it, it both grounds you to the earth and literally expands your heart energy mm. out all the way from your chest to your hands. It's a beautiful practice and very simple. Five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you can do. Okay, beautiful. Five or 10 minutes. Excellent. John, where can our listeners learn more about you? Uh, JohnWineland.com. I've got all kinds of stuff up there, programs and podcasts and stuff like that. So wine, like you drink, land, like you live on.com. Very roomy-esque. <laughs> Rumi talked a lot about getting drunk on love, drinking the yeah. wine. There you go. Wine land. I love it. John, uh, it's been, man, such an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. Um, yeah. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And, and um, yeah, man, thank you. It's my pleasure, Brian. It's good to spend some time with you, man. Likewise.